If you're new here at Vertical, my name is Verge, and I'm the pastor, and I love coming to church on Sunday to be with my spiritual family, and I love getting into God's word. Let me just share a few things uh, you may have heard, but let me emphasize something you didn't hear. Next Sunday, we're kicking off a new series specifically on the fear of God. Um, I've had this topic brewing inside of me for some time um, because I've come to understand that people can believe in Jesus, uh, that he exists, and even love him, but have no fear of God. And, uh, and so I want to help us understand what that means and um, how that should affect our lives as Christians today. So don't miss a Sunday in the next series. We're kicking that off next week. Also, uh, next week we're kicking off 21 days of prayer um, from the 6th to the 26th, Mondays through Fridays, 6 a.m. That's cra- crazy people get up at 6 a.m. to go pray. That's right, crazy people who love Jesus and are gonna see crazy results in their lives because of a crazy God who's crazy in love with them doing crazy good things in their lives. And so I wanna invite you to be part of something crazy good. I dare you. Um, you the last two weeks, last two weeks I shared two messages, which were, one was you're here for a reason, and then last week, God can use anybody, right? And so I kind of want to connect that because here's, here's the reality. If you're here for a reason and God can use anybody, and that includes you and me, the question is, what is it that God wants to do through us and how are we going to get it accomplished? Well, today's message is entitled, A Lifestyle of Prayer. Because there ain't no way you or me or anybody is going to accomplish anything significant in this world that God has called us to do unless we are connected to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Can I get an Amen. Anybody brought their Bible? Let me see it. Let me see if you got your sword, your Bible with you. I love it. I love it. I love it. Wave it, wave it, wave it. You got your sword. All right, put it down. Some of you have been coming for weeks and you keep ignoring this. The cameras are watching. Hey, if you're new and you don't have it, it's okay. We're going to have the verses on the screen, but I'm trying to do something here. I'm trying to equip and lift up a body of believers who knows God's word. And the true reality is that some people know how to click to a book of the Bible, but not how to find it. And so I have this strong conviction that I need to raise up Christians who actually know God's word. Uh, and so that's why, I'm, that's why I say that it's week after week. So some of you are like, you know, like, Pastor, like, get over it. Like, and I'm saying, no, you get over it. Bring it. Or at least bring a dictionary and just pretend like, yeah, you know, pretend. <laughs> so at least, you know, we feel like you want to do something. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to 1 Thessalonians 5. That's in the New Testament. I'm, I got a lot of verses. We're gonna, you might get cramps today in your fingers because we got a lot of Bible verses to go through. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. After that, we're going to go to Luke 18, John 15. Um, while you guys are looking for that, there's a lot of areas in our lives in which we need God's help to do what God's called us to do because it's impossible to do it on our own strength. Um, and even... Even if, by the way, you've tried to do things in your own strength, you eventually get to a point when you realize you can't. You get, you get to a point of frustration, maybe even a point of how. It's impossible. And, um, and it's a good reminder today, lifestyle of prayer. That's what we're going to talk about, a lifestyle of prayer. So, so what's prayer about? Prayer is about connecting us to the supernatural. Do, do you understand that God is supernatural? We're natural. We're part of his creation. God is supernatural. And so prayer connects us, the natural, with God, the supernatural. So prayer is something that invites the supernatural into our lives. I should should have gotten five amens on that one. It was never God's intention that you would live your life alone and only in the natural. It was always God's intention that you would be connected to him, to his body, which is the church, and to the supernatural because you can have a personal relationship with him. That is his heart. Prayer is key, and prayer is the way that we touch heaven and the way that heaven touches us. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 to 18, these are really short. Um, If you got it, say amen. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pause, let's stop right there. What's God's will for you in Christ Jesus? Well, when should we rejoice? Always. By the way, joy is not the same as happiness. 
Happiness is connected to happenings. It's circumstantial. It's on what's happening in the circumstances around us, uh, whereas joy is an internal state. I could be going through a valley and a difficult time and still remain with joy in my heart. It doesn't mean I'm happy about this hard thing I'm going through, but it means that my joy is not dependent on my circumstances. So rejoice always, and it says pray continually. Some of your versions might say pray without ceasing, right? Or, or pray without stopping, or pray always, pray continually. And, uh, and so here's, here's one of the phrases we've said here at Vertical Church for a long time. We say pray first. So when should we pray? Pray first. Uh, in every situation, we should do what? Pray first. When you wake up in the morning, pray first. Before you leave the house, Pray first. Before you take, make a big decision, pray first. How would it be in our lives if we simply prayed first? Now, <clears throat> when it says here, pray continually, or some versions, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean like all day, like you have to have your eyes closed, and, right? And, and, and be like in, in this state of, you know, like prayer mode. It means that you have God on your mind and in your heart throughout the day. You carry, you carry him, you carry his presence consistently. Prayer isn't a single moment in the morning when you wake up, maybe if that's when you pray, or a single moment before you eat your meal. <clears throat> As Christians, prayer is something that we should do, but I've realized as a pastor and a leader in the church for many, many years that less than 10% of Christians actually enjoy praying. In other words, sometimes we pray because we know it's a discipline that we have to do as Christians, but it's not like we're praying because, man, I really want to pray. And that, that tells me that we haven't many times de developed that muscle in our spiritual walk. Something that, that when we really engage in it and unlock the beauty and the power of connecting with the supernatural, with our God through prayer becomes so beautiful in your life that you get to a point when you really embrace it that you think, how did, I, how did I live without prayer before? And that's my prayer for us, especially as we approach 21 days of prayer in August. Um, and it would be amazing if, if we raise the percentage of believers who are passionate about getting with God consistently and continually. Um, check this out. Go to Luke 18. Go to Luke 18, a, a, few a few books to the left in the Bible there. And I love it. I love hearing pages turn of, of Bibles. I love it because I love the fact that, you're, that we're trying. I used to always joke around last year when we did the Bible series that when I was in youth group, I used to race everybody. Like whenever the youth pastor would say, go to whatever, I used to get there and I'd look around and be like, beat you. I used to always tell Ghislaine, I beat you. And then she started beating me. Luke 18, uh, look, what, look, what G, look what it says here, real quick, just this first verse, Luke 18, 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. <laughs> just that verse. Jesus told his disciples a what? A parable to show them something. What did he want to show them? That they should always pray and not give up. So here's the other line that we say here at Vertical. Prayer should be our first response and not our last resort. And I find, like, like, like we amen this. Like, amen, pastor, right? But a lot of times it's when we're already in this big mess. And I need prayer. Can you pray? I need to pray. I need prayer. What if we prayed first and maybe avoided that big mistake or that big hole or that situation? Because sometimes we're in situations that we got ourselves into, Right? So it's not like, oh God, you don't have mercy. It's like, God, get me out of the hole that I just got into. But if I would have prayed first, I might not have gotten in the hole in the first place. So prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. In other words, I'm not gonna just do what I wanna do and then if I need it, then I'll pray. I'm gonna choose <clears throat> to pray first. I wanna share some thoughts today. Go, go one, book, one book over to John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 15. I want to read a passage in John 15. Some of you who know a little Bible uh, might remember John 15 where it talks about Jesus gives this illustration um, about the vine and the branches. <clears throat> so John 15, look what it says in verse four. Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. Pause. What did he say? Remain in me. Key word, remain. 
remain. This is the challenge for us as Christians that we would be people that in our spiritual lives remain connected to God. Question, what are a few ways to remain connected to God? Getting into his word, praying, worshiping. These are things that open the door to connection. These are things that, that keep us in that state of remaining, remaining. Um, a lot of us sometimes as Christians have our Christianity boxed into what happens on Sunday morning. And it's hard sometimes to include our Christianity on what happens during the other days of the week, especially if we didn't grow up with the Lord in our lives, if we didn't grow up in a family that taught us to read the Bible, if we didn't, re if we didn't grow up in an environment where they, they encouraged us to pray. Um, and so I think this is one of, the, one, of the, one of the signs and the keys of authentic Christianity. Authentic Christianity is when we include our spiritual walk in every day of the week. It's kind of like, you don't say, okay, I'm gonna eat on Tuesday, but I'm not gonna eat on Wednesday or Thursday, but then I'll eat on Friday because we feed our bodies. But we're body, soul, and spirit. We talk about this in freedom curriculum, right? Spiritual order. Uh, we feed our body and we, and we never go a day without feeding our body unless we're specifically doing some kind of fast or we're preparing for a surgery or something, right? You know, and, and we feed our souls every day. Our, our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. That's why we look at beautiful things. That's why we watch movies. That's why we listen to music. That's why we like paint. That's why uh, we like beautiful things because it's, it feeds our soul. But so often we go days, weeks, even months without feeding our spirit. And the problem with that is the one that's strongest in your life is the one you feed the most. And that's why many of us are led by our flesh. When the Bible talks about flesh, that's body and soul. Most of us are led by our bodies, what our cravings, our appetites, or, or by our soul, which is our emotions, our feelings, and what we want. We have to train ourselves spiritually to get to the point where we're feeding our spirit so that our spirit can be stronger, leading the way, and soul and body line up with it. Does that make sense? And as Christians, the Holy Spirit lives in us. It's his spirit in us. But we have to remain. Look at what it says in uh, uh, John 15, 4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Jesus says, I am the vine you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. <laughs> so the key, according to Jesus, is to remain in him. And what it says is when we remain in him, just like the illustration of the branch connected to its vine, right? Connected to the trunk, right? When we remain in Jesus, something's gonna happen in our lives. It says that we are going to bear much fruit. Now, who would say here today, man, I would love to bear much fruit in my life. I would love to bear much fruit. Fruit is good things, by the way, the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control, right? We want to bear much fruit, but we can't bear fruit. Hey, we can't bear fruit if we're not connected and remaining. Connection in prayer. How does God speak to us predominantly? His word. How do we speak to him predominantly? Prayer. Every, any relationship needs two-way communication. And this is so important. So let me share with you real quick four, four principles that can revolutionize your prayer life, four principles that can spark a lifestyle of prayer. Let's talk number one, the priority of prayer. Help me out. The priority of prayer. We all have to determine what our priorities are in our lives. Now, what is a priority? It's something that I choose to put first in my life. I put it higher on the order of things, on the order of responsibility. So what do we say here at Vertical Church? When should we pray? Pray first. Pray first. Uh, that means it's a priority for us. Uh, the first has so much significance. And all throughout the Bible, every time we hear about first or first fruits, it, it always uh, does two things. Number one, it communicates priority to the person or the people whom you're doing it for and grabs their attention. In this case, when we pray first, it gets God's attention and, um, and, and he's aware of it. Number two, 
it sets a precedent for the rest. The first sets a precedent for the rest. Here's the way I like to say it. If you're taking notes, right? Remember, note takers, you're going to go first class to heaven. Amen? The first has the power to bless the rest. The first has the power. This is part of the principles of first, principle of first fruits. The first has the power to bless the rest. This is very important. Uh, what, you, what you do first, what I do first is very significant. The order is significant. Um, prayer, by the way, it works any time of the day, but I'm encouraging you to get into the habit of praying first. Keep praying throughout the day. Pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Yes. However, first, when you put it first, it makes a difference. When you put it first, it grabs God's attention. It sets a precedent for the rest. So, so what, what do we do? We pray first. Uh, when, why do we come to church on Sundays, generally speaking? Sunday is the first day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. As Christians, as believers, as Christ followers, ever since the resurrection of Jesus, the, worship, the day of worship changed to Sunday the first, because now we say, God, we want to give you the first day so that you can bless the rest. We don't give you the last day. We don't give you the middle of it. We give you the first because in the first is unleashed the power to bless the rest. God, we come and we give you the first day so you would be with, be with us throughout this week. Guide us, provide for us, Lord. We are honoring you. We seek you. We will worship you and seek and pray every day. But Lord, we're giving you this first day to come together and worship because the first unleashes blessing on the rest. You are first in my life, Lord. And so I put you first. Another, another area where sometimes, um, you know, we're not too clear on. Sometimes pastors don't preach it or teach on it well or right or with the wrong motive. But even the principle of tithing, uh, you know, a tithe, you don't need to be, I mean, you don't need to be a mathematician to understand how much a tithe is. A tithe, the word tithe literally means a tenth. But the issue, the greatest issue with the tithe is not so much the amount, because that's clear, it's the order. When is the tithe give, supposed to be given? First. And uh, I remember when I learned this lesson, all my life, I've given 10%. But I remember early on in our marriage, we discovered we weren't giving first. Because the first thing that we were paying was our mortgage, or the other thing, which by the way, the mortgage doesn't have the, the power to bless the rest. Uh, my car payment doesn't have the power to bless the rest. My utilities don't have the power to bless the rest. I realized, oh my gosh, I've been giving God 10% all the time, but I haven't truly been tithing because I haven't been giving him the first. When we shifted that, it unleashed something really, really significant in our lives. Why? Because when I give the, the last, there's nothing left to bless. But when I give the first, it blesses the rest. It is, how does it work? It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense economically, financially, or, or like socioeconomically. It doesn't make sense. But that's why these are spiritual principles. Are you with me? All right, so, so that, that's just, just I, somebody need to hear that today because I remember that transformed the trajectory of our commitment to the Lord because the key is in the first. Are you with me? The key is in the first. Um, I want you to think about this in relationship to your prayer life. Let's go to Daniel chapter six. So go back now to the Old Testament, to the, to the prophetic book of Daniel. And I want us to see something interesting in Daniel six. We're talking about <clears throat> the priority of prayer. <clears throat> and when something is a priority for you, it means it's important for you, right? If something's a priority, it means you're not gonna not do it. Why? Because it's a priority. Um, Daniel 6, verse 10. By the way, if you remember the story, King Nebuchadnezzar and his people, they said, oh, nobody's allowed to worship anybody, any God except for the idol that has been made up by King Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, <clears throat> obviously everybody obeyed except a few people. Daniel, in Daniel 6, verse 10, it says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, check this out, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. In other words, Daniel prayed like he always prayed. Why? Because prayer for Daniel was a priority. It was a priority. In fact, not only was it a priority, but even in the face of 
opposition and consequences, he still put prayer in a place of priority. So what am I telling you to do? I'm telling you, I'm asking you as your pastor, I'm, in, I'm, I'm encouraging you and advising you to set prayer as a priority in your life. If you use your phone to set up your appointments or your laptop or maybe even a regular physical agenda, put in your day time with God, prayer time. Put it in there. Put it in your agenda. It doesn't have to be a super long time. Just put it in saying, God, I'm putting you first. I'm putting you first. Second point today, second point, the place of prayer. So we have the priority of prayer and we have the place of prayer. Let's go back to the New Testament, Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one. I remember growing up, every time I would read verses in the Bible, even in youth group, I would always highlight it. So I encourage you, have a highlighter, have a have a pen, underline, later, chew on it a little bit more if something catches your attention. Mark chapter one, um, the place of prayer, it's, it's specifically talking about Jesus, verse 35. Mark one, <clears throat> verse 35. And it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he did what? Where he prayed. So even Jesus shows us he had a place, he had places. In this case, it says a solitary place because sometimes it's good to be disconnected from other distractions. Um, The Bible consistently shows us in the New Testament that Jesus had places where he prayed and it's good to have a place of prayer. I wonder, do you have a place of prayer? Um, Do you have an area, maybe at home, where when you pray, man, that's where you get in. That's your nook, your prayer nook. Some people have prayer closets, right? If you've ever seen the war room, you know, uh, I've always wanted that. I've never been able to do that, but like have like an actual room or like a space for that. Man, that's beautiful. And if not, okay, I'm gonna do it in my living room or I'm gonna do it in my, I don't, if you have to, if you have to get away from the kids or something, like go to the bathroom, put some pillows, I don't know, get in the tub, I don't know, do something, but find a place where you can connect with the Lord in prayer. A place, you know. Um, you know, I love 21 days of prayer, especially here coming physically, because I love being here and praying. Uh, and by the way, if you, if some of you, when you come to prayer, you'll see it. If you, if you haven't been here before, but some of us like to pace and walk. I love to walk and pace while I pray. Um, but it's so important to, to say there's a space, there's a place for me to pray. We are people of places and spaces. Uh, studies say that, oh, like throughout history, we've all pe- people have had two places: your home and then your work, or home and school, depending on your age, right? But sociologists say nowadays that people actually have three places. We have home, work or school, and then we also have this third place, which is called the virtual place, this place. It's funny because we don't physically go inside of it, but sometimes hours of our day are here. Whether it's social media, whether it's uh, uh, internet, email, like just kind of, there's a, if you go and you look at the, the, the report of daily report, a weekly report of how long, you know, it, it, now it's not just how many hours I'm spending at home and how many hours I'm spending at work or school, but now it's how many hours I'm spending in my virtual place. And here's the crazy thing. A lot of us, a lot of us sleep with this right next to us. And the first thing in the morning when we wake up, it's this and we're right there. First thing. Before we've had a chance to say, thank you, God, for another day. Before we've had a chance to say, Lord, I love you. This day's We're already here, and then we're looking at, oh, look, you know, and all of a sudden, 30 minutes go by, and we're already connected in this place. And so here's a challenge for you. Before you go to this place, go to this place. Go to this place, but it's going to require some discipline. It's going to require some intentionality. It's going to require the priority of prayer. And then identifying that there's a place of prayer. And I want to encourage you before you go to this place. Hey, I, by, by the way, I can get highly distracted if I, if I all of a sudden I see I got messages and all that. So I have to, I have to intentionally say, I'm not even going to pay attention. Pay no attention to that, right? Turn off the alarm if I'm using. Okay, great. First things first. First things first. Pray first. Pray first. Priority of prayer, the place of prayer. Number three, the plan of prayer. The plan of prayer. <clears throat> when you want to develop a relationship in your life, any relationship, it's usually better when you have a plan. Any of you married couples remember when you were boyfriend and girlfriend? 
and you made a plan, we're going to do this, and, you know, because, because generally when you plan, it helps it be a little more successful, and it's the same thing in our relationship with the Lord. Um, I've seen people who are like, Pastor, I just don't even know where to start. Hey, we, we want to read the Word of God but we want to find plans that will help us. Sometimes there's a good Bible reading plan or a devotional plan that gives you biblical teachings with <clears throat> practical application, um, connecting with others that are doing it. There's a plan. Are you following me? Okay, so I want to give you a quick, I want to give you a quick um, um, recommendation. Grab your phone real quick. Grab your phone real quick. Um, this is only for one minute, and then you've got to put that phone down. Um, Go to the app store, and I want you to find this, this app. Pray first. Pray first. This is a great app. Pray first. <clears throat> it says pray first, then it says slash prayer life. It's like white, and it says pray first right in the middle. I want you, it's a free app. I want you to download that app. That app literally gives you multiple prayer plans. For example, if you want to follow the Lord's Prayer, the, you know, the prayer that Jesus prayed, right? That he, it wasn't meant that we would just repeat that all the time. What he did is he gave us a model to follow. And you could follow that model as you pray. There's the prayer of Jabez. There's the prayer of Daniel. There's all kinds of plans of prayer. Does that make sense? And if you prefer Spanish, because maybe you're bilingual and you prefer Spanish, you could change the app to Spanish language, right? Does that make sense? I'm trying to put some tools in your hands to help you. So that, so that you and I don't have excuses to say, well, nobody taught me to pray. Some of us, some of us maybe grew up in environments where nobody taught us to pray. Some of us grew up in religions where what they taught us to do is just to memorize and recite the same words over, kind of like robotically, which is not very heartfelt or meaningful, generally speaking. And so, and some of us grew up in an environment where prayer, like what? Like, like prayer is what? Isn't that like for old people? Like, right? Like, how do you do that? And then some of us have this idea that prayer is like, <clears throat> like I don't know the word, you know, Pastor Rich, I'm sorry, I, just, I don't know the words yet to use, like, because, because we have this thought that like prayer is like, okay, for thou, O Lord of the heavens, are the miraculous savior of the kingdoms of the earth beyond the species of humanity. That's not prayer. Prayer is, here's a good prayer, by the way. God I don't know how to pray. Can you help me? <laughs> That's a heartfelt prayer. Lord, can you put people on? By the way, if you want to learn how to play basketball, who do you want to get around? People who play basketball. If you want to learn and develop, then you want to go out and play with people who play. If, if you want to learn how to pray, then you have to get around some people who pray. And you have to learn from them. Does that make sense? That's why 21 Days of Prayer is kind of like a beautiful, like win-win all around because it's like you could come and you don't even have to say it Although you could, but you don't have to say, like, I don't know how to pray. You can just come and just pretend, like, you know, and then just be, like, learning and watching, right? Like, I'm going to learn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow. Does that make sense? The plan of prayer. There's different plans, different ways. I just put a tool literally in your hands. By the way, there's also the uh, version Bible app. It's the most downloaded Bible app in the world. I literally was at Life Church a couple days ago with Craig Rochelle and, and the guy who started this, Danny Grunewald. Bobby Grunewald, who started Version Bible app, the millions and millions of downloads of God's word. I mean, it is a beautiful thing. And there's all kinds of devotionals for men, for women, for couples, for students, for kids, in English and Spanish, in every language. Like, like, check out the Version Bible app if you don't have it. And that's another where, place where you can get some plans of devotionals to follow, where you read and then you pray based on what you've read. Does this make sense? When you pray, you can have lists of people that you're praying for things that you're praying for. Um, and by the way, I encourage you to break the habit of only praying for yourself. Like, like break the habit, like get out of the, uh, you know, the wounded sheep prayer. A lot of Christians have the wounded sheep prayer. Right? Like everything is, Lord, bless me. Oh, Lord, heal me. Give to me what I want for me, myself, and I, right? Get out of that and, and learn to pray for others and learn to pray for people and, and, and fill the gap and intercede as well. But these are just ways, these are plans, these are ways that you can pray. Uh, and by the way, give, prayers of thanksgiving, giving God thanks. Um, man, there's so many beautiful ways and prayer can become so rich in your life. Look at Luke 11, let's go to Luke 11.
Like, I, like I'm, I'm praying and believing that for some of us, prayer can truly become a delight, man. Like, it's not like, oh gosh, I gotta go pray. It's like, okay, I can't wait. You know what happens when you start really getting into prayer, like really getting into time with God? You know what happens? Before, like, like when you first start, you're like, oh my gosh, after, how long is this? Like, this is an hour, this prayer time? Like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? And then later, later, time goes by and you're like, it's over? I'm not even halfway done with what I had in my heart to express to the Lord and share and writing and, oh. Like, like what, what at first seems like, I don't even think I can pray for 10 minutes. Eventually it's like, man, I need, 30 more because you begin to delight in it. Luke 11, one, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And so, and so what they were doing is they were observing Jesus and they were listening to Jesus. And it's apparent that Jesus was praying out loud. Why? because they were listening and they were saying, can you teach us to pray like you pray? And just like John taught his disciples, can you teach us? And then verse two, he said to them, when you pray, say, and then the Lord led them there, right? And again, the intention wasn't that they would always recite the same words. The intention was that they would follow his model in connecting with the Father. Does that make sense? When you begin to pray and you begin to connect with your supernatural God, it changes everything in your life. <clears throat> Last and final point, the persons of prayer. The persons of prayer. If you notice, there's a capital P because I'm talking specifically about the Trinity. Our God is three in one. <clears throat> Our God is three in one. He is Father. He is Son. He is Holy Spirit. And it's so important for us to develop in our prayer life a connection with our Father, with our Savior, and with our Helper. Why is this important? Because we connect to God, not religiously, we connect to God relationally. It's a relationship with the Lord. <clears throat> and it's interesting that even though the three are one, we relate to each in a different way. And when we do so, it brings great significance. Um, <clears throat> After years of being a leader in the church, even when I used to lead under my father, I've just, I've been able to see over and over throughout the years, and I'm convinced that the reason why many people, and maybe, maybe you, maybe your, your relationship with God is not where it should be and probably could be, is because your perspective of God isn't the right perspective. Um, <clears throat> back in the day, we used to do this, this drama a skit that we used to do to, you know, to bring like a truth. And, and it was called Wrong Ideas About God. And, uh, and the first scene, it would be <clears throat> like, a, like a sheriff whoosh, with a whip in the hand. And some people, some of you, the God that you are aware of or the God that was presented to you was this sheriff, judge, authoritarian, whip in the hand God that is telling you, you better turn or you're gonna burn. And if you mess up, whoosh, you're mine. And the problem is if that's, if that's the God that you've been presented, I can understand why you're like, why you're not saying like, yeah, I wanna be with him, right? It's kind of like, can I stay away from him? And a lot of times that's what religion paints to us or a lot of times that's the idea that we have of God. But let me tell you, that's a wrong view of God. Other people have this view of God that he's this raggedy old man in a rocking chair and a cane who could barely get up from his rocking chair who used to be powerful back when he created the earth, but now he is irrelevant and old and powerless. And that's the reason why you're not going to him for power because you see him as an old man in a rocking chair. It's a wrong view of who God is. Others see God as a, as a waiter. What can I do for you today? I like this and I like that. And can I have two of these, right? And it's like I come to him when I need things as if he were a waiter, as if he were a puppet that I control. And then if he doesn't do what I want him to do, then he messed up. I don't believe in him. It's a wrong view of who God is. And others have a view of God that he's this, he's like a little nerd who you take out of the box when you need him and you put him back. And if you don't need me, I'll be in my little box. But if you need me, holler. And when I need him, I'll rub the lamp and he'll come out. And, I'll, and, 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 and like if he's a genie in a bottle, God, 
No wonder you have no relationship. Who wants to be, who's attracted to that God in the box? The truth is, we have an almighty, all-powerful God who deserves our fear and respect, who loves us, has a plan for our life, and has the key for fulfillment and purpose and significance. The problem is many of us haven't approached him because we don't know him right because we don't see him right. The persons of prayer. Your perspective of God will determine your relationship with him. Do you hear me? Your perspective of God will determine your relationship or your approach to him. Paul writes something interesting in 2 Corinthians 13. Let's go real quick. I want you to highlight this verse in your Bible. Sometimes, uh, sometimes writers of books in the New Testament would, would write a greeting or maybe even a benediction, like a blessing <clears throat> at the beginning or at the end of some chapters. And in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, just, just this one simple verse, and I want you to highlight it, circle it. Look what Paul says. He kind of he grabs the three persons of God, and he says, <clears throat> he says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way, that's God the Son, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Right here, Paul introduces us to our triune God and the order is important and each has a purpose. As we close off this message, let's talk about the first one, the grace or the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first dimension of prayer that you need to understand is who Jesus is. Jesus, check this out, is the one in charge of carrying your prayers to the Father. That's why we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We pray to God in the name of Jesus because Jesus is the mediator between God and man, between man and God. Jesus connects us. In the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for us. He's inter, inter, between God and us. So when I pray, when I pray, for example, Lord Jesus, I am facing this problem right now. And Lord, I place this situation in your hands because I don't know what to do and I need your help. What Jesus does is he goes to the Father and he intercedes on our behalf and he says, Father, Verge is going through some crazy times right now. And let me tell you, Dad, that's hard because I know what it's like because I lived, I went through it and I experienced it. And, and Jesus intercedes. The Son intercedes for us to the Father. And why? Because he can. Why? Because he can relate. Why can he relate? Go to Hebrews 4. Go to Hebrews. That's towards the end of the Bible, almost towards the back. <clears throat> it's important for us to understand that my relationship with Jesus changes everything. And his, Jesus' heart and his desire is that we would be connected to the Father that's why Jesus paid the price on the cross for our sins and the cross became a bridge that reconnected us with the Father despite the cliff between us of sin. Hebrews 4.15, look what it says about Jesus. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, by the way, a, a high priest is or a priest somebody that represents you. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. So check it out. What that means is that Jesus can understand everything we go through because he went through everything we've gone through. The only difference between Jesus and us is that he never sinned and we did. And so this is a good thing because he did experience what we've experienced. He can go to the Father on our behalf and intercede. That's why he lived 33 years on this earth. I mean, think about it. Wouldn't it have been easier if he just was born and then crucified as a kid and just quickly like get it done, right? He lived the life. He experienced life on this earth. He experienced rejection and abandonment and denial and hurt, <clears throat> discouragement. Like he experienced those things. He never sinned. 
And so, verse 16, Hebrews 4, 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. <clears throat> you don't have to look it up right here on the screen, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus wants to know that you and I depend on him and that we understand that we cannot do anything if we're not remaining and connected to him. That's the, that's the, <clears throat> the grace of Jesus Christ, the son. Second, the love of God, the father. The love of God, the father. Now the problem for many people is that your experience with your earthly father has contaminated your experience with your heavenly father. What does that mean? <clears throat> Some people have a hard time seeing God as dad because your dad maybe didn't do a good job. Maybe was absent. Maybe never even met him. Maybe was physically present and emotionally absent, or maybe did some things that really, really hurt you. And so some people can see God as Lord and as master, but not father. And I don't know if this applies to you, but let me tell you, if that is the case with you, this is something that the Lord wants to heal in you because there's no way you can receive from God what he has for you unless you see him as father. And I'm the first one to say, I'm sorry for anything that you've been through. <clears throat> and I'm sorry for any pain you've walked through, but let me tell you, there is nothing more beautiful than being able to come to God as your father. Despite any mistakes your biologic fa biological father has made, despite any shortcomings, or despite any mistakes you as a father have made, coming to God as our father is so, is so important. You know, Paul writes in Ephesians 3.14, for this reason I kneel before the father. Back in Jewish culture in those days, if you went into the room where your father was present and you kneeled before him, he would put his hands over you, he would bless you, he would kiss you, and he would speak words of life over you. And this is exactly what our heavenly father wants to always do in our lives. He wants to cover us. He wants to let us know that we are loved and, expect, uh, and accepted by him, and he speaks words of life over us through his word all the time. He sees us as his children, but we don't always see him as our father. And I know it's hard for some of us to do that. I'm here to tell you he wants to heal that in you because there's no way you're gonna experience everything in that relationship if you can't relate to Jesus, his grace, the son, but also to the father, his love. You wanna know how God is? Let's go to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, this is the last biblical passage and I want you to highlight what we're gonna read. Let's go to Psalm 103. Psalms right in the middle, kind of in the middle chunk of your Bible. The Old Testament. <clears throat> Let's just read a little bit about our Father's <clears throat> heart. Psalm 103, starting in verse 8. This is a good one to like read over later. It says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. By the way, that's mercy. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. If you want to have a good relationship with God, you're going to have to have the right perspective of who he is. And there he is, Psalm 103. So there's the grace of the son, Jesus. There's the love of the father, God, father. And then lastly, there's the fellowship or the communion of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the, what's the role of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> some people are really cool with Jesus because he died on the cross, and some people are really good with, you know, the Father because, you know, okay, I understand the Father relationship. Some people are like, what's this whole Spirit thing? And, you know, what's that all about? Can I just have the two and leave the third out? 
There's something so beautiful about the Holy Spirit. Even Christians sometimes miss out on a lot of what the Holy Spirit has to offer. Some people believe that parts of the Spirit are no longer alive or that gifts of the Spirit are no longer alive. And I'll just tell you one thing. There is nothing in the Bible that tells me that God stopped being God or that Jesus stopped being Jesus or the Holy Spirit stopped being the Holy Spirit. And so I've learned in my life to say, God, I want everything you want for me and I'm not gonna just take other people's word for it because sometimes I might not believe some things because of what somebody else said or somebody else's experience, but Lord, forgive me because there was a season in my life where I was a little closed off to the Holy Spirit and the Lord turned my life around and I had to repent before God and say, Holy Spirit, I want everything you want have me. Not just what I feel comfortable with, not just what I, what I think I understand, not just what this denomination says, what this religion says, I want everything you have. And if it's not of you, I don't want it. But if it is of you, I want everything. And the Lord flipped my world upside down. And I began to know him in ways I didn't know him before and connect with him in ways that I never connected before and pray in ways that I never prayed before. It changed my life, spiritually speaking. It enriched my relationship with God. With a clear connection with Jesus the Son, a clear connection with God the Father, but now a connection with the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is when you pray, you know, to, to, to the Lord in Jesus' name and you pray, pray to the Father, the difference with the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit says, all right, let's go. And he stays with me along the journey. Now I'm not alone. You know, in fact, in the Greek, the original word for Holy Spirit is parakletos, which literally means the one who comes alongside to help. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And so as I'm living my life, there are moments have you ever, as a Christian, have you ever felt, I shouldn't do that? <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit. Or have you ever felt that, I should do this, and it's something of the Lord, it's something of the Lord. And, and, and so I'm saying, Holy Spirit, I invite you into every area, into every aspect of my life. I invite you into my home. I invite you into my marriage. I invite you. I want everything that is of you in me. I want your giftings. I want your fruit. I want to walk with you. I don't want to be away from you. The Holy Spirit has been called to be with us always. What is he there for? To guide, to counsel, to speak to you, to hold you back sometimes when you want to do something. Hold up. To minister to you, that's the Holy Spirit. And so it's the persons of prayer. And I relate to my God through Jesus, God the Son, through God the Father, through the Holy Spirit. That's why you need to understand the grace of Jesus and the fact that Jesus carries your prayers to the Father, you need to understand that when you get to the Father, he is not this wild sheriff with a, with a whip in his hand ready to whip you when you mess up. No, he's a heavenly Father who is there to lift you up and embrace you and show you his love. And when you realize who the Holy Spirit is in your life, you realize that it is an intimate fellowship and relationship. It can't be compared to a physical relationship. It can't be compared. It's beyond what we can even understand sometimes, but it's so good and it's so real. The grace of Jesus, may the grace of Jesus, may the love of the Father, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. You want to open the door to that? Begin to live a lifestyle of prayer. <clears throat> I want to pray. Two prayers. I want to pray this prayer over our lives that we would lean in to a lifestyle. By the way, by the way, praise God for a church that actually opens up the door and says, hey, you want to learn to pray? Hey, come pray. Hey, we're doing 21 days in a row, by the way. You can connect online or you can come, you know. Now, there's reasons sometimes when you can't come, but let me just tell you, a virtual kiss is nice, but when I get to kiss my wife, that's like in person, that's for real. So there's something beautiful about being here. There's something beautiful about getting here on that Monday morning, when we, you know, after that Sunday. And we kick off on Monday at 6 a.m. And then you look around, you're like, this is crazy. All these people here, young people, older people, all kinds of people here to pray? People are crazy. And I'm like, yeah, crazy. Because we're crazy in love with a crazy God who does crazy good things for crazy people who love him and seek him in crazy ways. That seems crazy to the world, but it's powerful changes your spiritual walk with God like never before. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word, which points us to you. And Lord, we've been talking these last couple of weeks of the fact that we're here for a reason and that you can use anybody. But the truth is, 
for any of that to happen. We need you. And so today, Lord, some of us honestly have to repent and say, we're sorry. We're sorry that we haven't been more intentional in seeking you in prayer. We're, forgive us, Lord, for not having you in a place of priority in our days or our weeks or our finances or our time. Lord, forgive us, but, but help us. We don't want to stay on that track. We want to put you in a place of priority. We want to recognize the priority of prayer. And Lord, we want to develop a place of prayer at home, at work, at school, even here at church. And Lord, we want to understand that, that we need a plan for prayer. We, we can follow your word and we can follow devotionals. We can follow examples of prayer in the Bible that are a model for us to begin to develop our communication with you, Lord. And Lord, we want to understand the persons of prayer. Understanding that we are connected to Jesus by his grace. And Jesus, that you intercede on, on our behalf before the Father. And we want to receive the extravagant love, Father, that you have for us, even when we don't deserve it. And Holy Spirit, ooh, Holy Spirit, we need you. We want you. We invite you. We are not afraid of you. We, are not, we don't want just pieces of what you offer. We want everything that you are even the parts we don't understand. We love you. We embrace you. We need you. Lord, I pray that there would be a revolution of prayer that would come to life over these next couple of weeks that would give us direction and guidance not only for the rest of this year, but for the rest of our lives. I pray, Lord, that praying would become a delight, a priority, a powerful experience that we activate daily with you in our relationship with you. So, Lord, we love you, and we receive everything you've given us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.